Um, hi folks, welcome. If you're here for our event with Kyle Beachy and Jose Vadi, you're in the right place. We're here tonight celebrating Kyle's book, The Most Fun Thing, Dispatches from a Skateboard Life. I'm Carr, I'm the events coordinator here for Green Apple Books in San Francisco, California. I'm gonna tell you about a couple of upcoming events that we have going on here at the store uh, on Monday, August 23rd at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Beth Morgan will be joining us discussing her debut novel, A Touch of Jen, with Pizza Girl author Jean Kyung Frazier. Beth's book is so good and uproariously funny and dark in turn, and it's definitely meant to be read during summer. So you should catch that on Monday, August 23rd at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And on Tuesday, August 24th at 6 p.m., Jamie Lowe will be joining us to discuss her book, Breathing Fire, Female Inmates on the Front Line of California's Wildfires. I cannot tell you how important and how incredibly relevant this book is. Uh, Jamie will be in conversation with Hamilton Nolan, and that is this coming Tuesday, August 24th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. We have a full calendar of our events on our website at greenapplebooks.com. And if you like events such as the one that you are joining us for tonight, you might wanna check it out. Uh, all of our events are free unless stated otherwise. That being said, please do buy books if you can. Please do buy them from us if you can, as opposed to a cowboy hatted billionaire that one might think of. Uh, we will have book plates uh, for Kyle's book for the most fun thing. So if you do want a signed copy, I will absolutely share the link in the chat here and write signed in your order comment. And we will send that copy to you when we get the book plates, which will be in the next couple of days. So I guarantee it might be a couple of days longer, but you will still like the book by the time you get it. So if you hold out, you can get that signed copy for yourself. Um, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce the authors that are joining us this evening. First, we have Jose Bari, who is the author of Interstate, Essays from California, coming out from Soft Skull in September. An award-winning essayist, poet, and playwright, his writing has appeared in Catapult, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Quarter Snacks, Free Skate Magazine, and Pop-Up Magazine. You can find him at josevadi.com and at Vadi Party across social media platforms. Pre-order this man's book. I am going to share the link in the chat. Please do welcome Jose Vadi. Yay! And last but certainly not least, Kyle Beachy's first novel, The Slide, won the Chicago Reader's Best Book by uh, Chicago author Reader's Choice Award for the year 2009. His short fiction has appeared in journals including Fanzine, Pank, Hobart, Juked, and others. His writing on skateboarding has appeared in The Point, The American Reader, The Chicago Inn, The Skateboard Mag in the US, Jankum, Deadspin, and elsewhere. He teaches at Roosevelt University in Chicago and is a co-host on the skateboarding podcast, Bent City, with pro skater Ryan Lay and others. His book, The Most Fun Thing, Dispatches from a Skateboard Life, is the reason we are here this evening. So please join me in welcoming Kyle Beachy. Yeah. Hi. Hi. What's up, everyone? Hi. What's up, Kyle? Jose, it's good to Hi. see you. Good to see you too. Uh, before, I think you're going to kick us off with a, with a reading, an excerpt from your book. But before we get into that, uh, can we address the shirt that you're wearing? Is this a four star throwback of the Gons? Is this I have two of these. Yeah, one of them doesn't fit. One's an XL um, in gray, a heather gray, a really comfortable one. This one fits, as you can see, my slim frame. Yes. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's getting a little stained. I'm trying not to be too precious with it, but yeah, you know, four star, RIP. <laughs> I'm here for it though. I'm here for it. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, and you know, thanks everyone for joining us. You know, um, Kyle's gonna kick us off with an excerpt. We just wanted to shout out Green Apple Books for being awesome and hosting us and promoting Kyle's work, my work. It's really appreciated. Um, shout out to everyone who is a fan of Kyle's work. Um, everyone from Skate Twitter that tuned in. Um, anyone that's involved with skateboarding, thank you. Uh, we're gonna have some questions. I'm gonna rifle off to Kyle. We're gonna have time at the end for a Q&A. So stick around for that if you have any questions. 
Um, this book, The Most Fun Thing, which is backwards on screen maybe, but I don't know, is what we're celebrating. And uh, it came out last week. If you don't have it, get it from your local. And uh, we're gonna start off with Kyle. Thank you, um, Jose. I'm really, I couldn't imagine having this conversation with a, a, a better person. So I'm really, really hyped to get into this. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is read chapter 15. Uh, and the only thing you really need to know about this is um, that one of the threads of the book is that I, I, I tried for a long time to write my second novel about skateboarding. And that presented some kind of key problems for me. Um, and yeah, b beyond that, the only thing I'll say is that I want to read this uh, because it involves San Francisco. Um, it shouldn't take more than five minutes. So without further ado, chapter 15 on narrative. Whatever the personal challenges of the work and my difficulties along the way in treating them, the incremental ego deaths, the preference always to be outdoors on a skateboard rather than inside on a laptop, the lattice work of doubts and trembling fears, the artistic challenge of my second novel had always been clear, to merge the energies of skateboarding with those of narrative. A story is a movement through time, tracing a path from one set of conditions to new, somehow different conditions. Meaning is made in the differences between conditions and the path of the quest between them. And how do we conceive of a quest, any quest at all? A quest is a framework based on shortage. What does this character want? Why do they want it? The quest is the natural outcome of a desire born from a lack even when the shape of this lack is not always obvious. In fact, the best of our lacks are those that reveal themselves along the way. In the field of writing pedagogy, imagination and subjectivity are largely seen in, as goals in themselves. To teach story is largely the process of filling out a character's desire and imagining a compelling network of obstacles to that desire. But what of the quest that is premised not on a lack, but abundance? Tunnel into the mind of the skateboarding subject in the thrall of their activity, and you'll find that every single thing they want already exists beneath the very wide and endlessly deep tent of this huge encompassing world. Ask a skateboarder what they want, and they'll go to the window and point a finger outside. That. And lacking a lack, the standard quest gives way to less linear types of movement. We see repetition and redundancy, spirals that tread over familiar paths, meaning derived not from change, but rather constant shifting tensions between body and place, stasis and movement, physical risk and private non-monetary reward. But then occasionally the sky would clear. Like one day in 2015, moving through San Francisco with the camera, and then another day, weeks later, sitting down in the chair with coffee in the giant word file, all disarranged and unfinished and flawed in every conceivable way with the photos I'd taken weeks prior up now on the screen. I'd start in on some writing and feel just the tiniest presence somewhere behind me. I heard the fucker and I stared into the screen with the little black keys under my fingers and there it was. An undefined, overexposed, blown out sky presiding over a culture out of place and a place out of use. The spot after all was a bridge, China banks, the famous China banks. And beneath the bridge, there are men who slap cards onto overturned cardboard boxes while others crowd around to watch. And through those red columns of the gate that separates the bridge from the neighborhood, you can see the women doing their handkerchief dance and smiling semi unison. And to know looking at the bricks in the photo, that the banks are so steep and so rough as to murder a skateboard's nose and tail. And in this small reciprocity between the board that's blamed for the city's destruction and the symmetrical destruction the city wreaks upon the board, there is the sound of a resonance that calls you back into the thing deeper this time than the last. Which is to say, that much of my desire to write about skateboarding has grown from my own lack, which in turn has affected the ways I perceive the activity along with its films. We are always, after all, looking for what we want. The resonance of creative damage, of the strange physical discourse of a city's people and cultures, unison and discord of games and dance and angled surfaces. That was the energy I wanted. 
On many occasions over the last decade, that has meant an aversion to stories and a suspicion of those who would tell them cleanly. Stories, I mean, that are effective and meaningful, the well-designed objects that diminish rather than honor mystery. In skateboarding as elsewhere, the most competent and elegant of our storytellers have been brands. One way to define a poem might be, a poem is the opposite of a brand. One reason to write them might be to affirm authorship as the province of human beings. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I love that passage uh, for a lot of reasons. It, it kind of underlies a lot of the themes that run throughout the book um, and new conversations that have happened in skateboarding in like the past, I don't know, 10 years or so that your book covers. Um, and that's, I actually wanted to ask you about the day, question number one. So thank you for reading my mind. Uh, what was, there's a couple, you know, this book has multiple essays scattered across four different sections covering about 10 years worth of your life and, and skateboarding's existence as an industry and as a, as a thing, right? Yeah. Um, what was your first interaction with skating in San Francisco? There's a couple different mentions of it in the book, but you know, in, like, in real life, what was the first time you skated the city? Okay, so the, the, the first time I came to San Francisco um, must have been 1996 with my father uh, because he, he had something, he had, my father is a scientist. Um, and so um, I spent a lot of my childhood and very fortunately traveling with him around the world because he would give talks and he would let me come along. Um, and so he had an event in San Francisco and I was at the time, I think, looking at colleges. So I came and looked at Berkeley and went to Palo Alto because I, I was hoping to go to Stanford, which I did not get into, moot point. Um, and I, I remember, I, and I write about it in the book, I remember um, the experience. And I want to say I was alone. I think he was at his thing then. And I was sort of wandering the city alone. And I remember walking down Market Street. Um, and, you know, because Market Street is brick, I had a sense that I was going in the right direction, you know, and all of San Francisco, all of Market basically funnels you toward the Embarcadero, which is, of course, where I was going. Um, and I remember, I remember seeing the palm trees and thinking like, oh, oh my God, like, this is it. And then, you know, kind of turning the corner and feeling um, that thing, uh, which we could describe as like a, a really benevolent kind of nausea. Like I, I felt like I was going, I, I felt like I was puking. Like I felt as if um, everything I had been watching for the last, you know, what, like eight years, nine years of my life um, suddenly had leapt out of being this sort of like notional um, idea of a place into, into reality and that I was part of that reality. And it really kind of blew my mind. Um, and then within probably about an hour of just kind of, you know, sitting on the three at Embarcadero or like sitting at some of the picnic tables. And then I kind of like moved my way over to the seven, like the C block. And I sort of sat there and I was awkward as hell. Cause I didn't know what I, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. There were no iPods. I didn't have like a, you know, I didn't have a CD man with me. So I wasn't, I didn't even have music. Um, and then I crossed, then I like crossed the street and went up the street to the pier into Pier 7. Um, and somewhere along the way, like I ran into James Kelch and James Kelch essentially convinced me to buy his old board. And I think it was a warped board or there was, it was a one-off. There was something very wrong with this board. Um, but Kelch essentially like got me to buy it. Um, and that was it. And then I was like, you know, I was, I was smitten by the city. You're probably a member of an alumni of like an illustrious group of skaters <laughs> that have bought used products from one James Couch at totally. Justin Herman Plaza, aka Embarcadero, you know? And I knew at the time, I knew at the time, I was like, this doesn't seem right. Like this doesn't, I don't think this is legit, but I like, I didn't care. It was, it was, it was, you know, man, like you, you've had this experience surely of like your early stages of being around a pro, like in the wild, not like at a demo, but you just come upon them and they're in their world. Like this is their world. San Francisco was their world. And I was suddenly a part of it. And I was just like gobsmacked. I couldn't, there was no way that I was going to do anything rational or responsible. I was just like, you know, Kelch could have asked for all the money I had on me. And I'd have been like, yes, here you are, James. Thank you. <laughs> 
Yeah. It's so funny too, because I, I wanted to ask you about that because, you know, we just met each other in real life in the Bay Area, got to skate in Rockridge in Oakland and stuff like that. But I feel like in the coming, growing up in Southern California myself and coming to the Bay Area and starting to skate, the spots are so like naked in a sense, like just kind of nowhere to hide. You know what I mean? There's, it's not a schoolyard. It's not necessarily, it's usually some type of public plaza or anything. So, but, um, so I, I really appreciate your answer and the Kelp story is pretty spot on, but you know, it, it leads me into this, this whole book, this is the most fun thing, you know, it's this relationship of yourself, your body and space. There's these ongoing conversations of time. It's passing, how you're measuring it as a skater, as a husband, as a writer. There's so much in this book that is beyond, you know, skateboarding. It's the thread, but I feel like once folks dive into this as a, as a skater or a citizen, a uh, secular member of society, however you want to phrase it, uh, you know, it's, there's a lot going on here um, across these four sections and these many essays over many years. How did you talk us through how you started to organize this? Because um, even within these skateboarding essays, you're referencing all sorts of stuff and weaving it into these essays, everything from art history to, you know, Sontag and Rebecca Solnit quotes, you know, so take us through like, how did you initially you know, out of the failed novel and begin to collect these essays. How did you arrange all this? Did you call it failed, my novel, Jose? No. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> um, so, yeah, I mean, I, the, no, the, the failure of the novel, the sort of challenge of the novel, the fact that I couldn't do what I wanted to do in the form of a novel, right? I just, yeah. like, that. that is what failure is, right? Just set out to do a thing and then find that you can't do it, right? Um, cool. And in that sense, yeah, the, attempting to do what I wanted to do with skateboarding did not um, align with what a novel is. It just didn't work out for me, um, mm -hmm. which is not to say that it can't ever. It's just to say that my approach to it didn't pan out. But in that failure, in, in realizing that what I was trying to do actually maybe wasn't best suited for a novel, but maybe could find expression in other forms, um, you know, what, what happened more or less is that I started writing essays as a way to kind of drain away some of the thoughts that I thought were getting in the way of the novel, right? Like I thought that by um, trying to write essays in the novel, I was ruining the novel. Um, and I thought, well, what if I, what if I like, like clear the system a little bit? Like what if I open up this valve a little and write some critical essays? So um, the essay started as just kind of standalone critical objects. Take a thing. The first one I wrote about was, was really Nigel Houston's Rise and Shine part in 2011, which was interesting for a number of reasons. It was the first kind of, it was one of the first a la carte standalone pay to own video parts, right? The transition from full videos to single parts was a big deal. Nigel's narrative as a character was a big deal. That was the video that half of it, he's got his little kid dreads and half of it, he doesn't have his little kid dreads. So the metaphors were just like spiraling everywhere. So I was like, well, let's, let's try to write about this. Um, and then after that, each, each ensuing essay was kind of a standalone thing. But what I realized very quickly was in fact, they were they were sort of stacking on top of each other. Like whatever work I did with Nigel would inform what I was talking about with Nike. Um, and so as much as I wanted them to be standalone objects, the fact was, is that I was kind of on a sort of path. Mm. Um, and, you know, in some ways that really worked out because each, each essay kind of um, became more informed and, you know, the trajectory they're on is they got more personal um, and they got more and more kind of bigger questions rather than being about skateboarding, you know, per se, they started being more about the body um, and space and time and memory um, and, you know, eventually questions about the sacred. But at, at other times it was really hard. Like there was one essay I wrote for the magazine, The Point, where the editor was like, I need you to, to essentially do some basic introductory work to skateboarding. I was like, no, I've already done that. Like, no. Mm -hmm. um, so there were there were challenges of that along the way, but essentially what it was was writing individual essays for ten years, um, and then you know submitting those fifteen or so essays because it's not like I was writing a lot; I was writing them once every like six months. Um, submitting those and then turning what that was into a bigger book, which is awesome, you know. And it's that dedication over that much of time is 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 is, is like a, is a really interesting project and. Talking about explaining skateboarding as a writer, 
I, speaking for myself, I imagine that would be very frustrating, you know, um, to describe what an ollie is or setting up your grip tape at a price skate shop, you know, shout out, or, you know, uh, how the ollie and the friction of an ollie relates to the concepts of marriage. Like, you know, it's, it's interesting how you break it down in all these different ways. How difficult was that for you? Because like the first section or two has a good amount of that that's very helpful for your arguments. And how did you tackle that? I mean, I think probably the best way to answer that is that anything I was looking for or anything that ended up being a connection, um, I don't feel like was a connection I made. I think that was a connection I noticed, right? Like I think I really do on a kind of basic level believe um, that some of the foundational tensions and connections and mysteries of human existence exist within skateboarding. Like I think skateboarding actually has them. So it's not, it, it, it was less about like drawing a line between these things. And it was more about like, boy, the longer you look at this thing, the longer you stare into this hobby slash sport slash art slash whatever, whatever language we attach to skateboarding, practice, discipline, whatever, the longer you look at it and, you know, the longer you practice it, because throughout these 10 years, I was also doing it all the time. Um, and doing it with a body that was increasingly resistant to it um, and doing it in ways that were newly frustrating because I was aging and so on. Mm. Um, the fact was, is that those connections just sort of presented themselves, you know? I mean, I, I, think, I think what I was more than anything was open to where skateboarding led. And, you know, back to sort of that reading and that question of a novel versus an essay, like a novel... A novel at its best um, is, is a certain kind of movement. A novel at its worst is a way to kind of foreclose on mystery and to kind of close doors and narrow to a point. Um, mm. And I just never narrowed. I mean, what, what I did was kind of the deeper I got into it, the larger the cavern of skateboarding was. Um, and that, again, that's a testament to skateboarding. And that's also, I guess, a testament to the form of the essay. You know, the essay, like poetry, has no obligation to create meaning. And, and as such, it, it allows for whatever the sort of subject and the individual who's moving into that subject, whatever happens there. And sometimes that's nothing, right? I mean, a, a poem doesn't have to do anything. Um, and I think, I think, for me, finding the essay and and learning to write the essay, right? I mean, yeah. I didn't know what I was doing when I started writing essays. You know, like you are an essayist. I mean, that's clear when you read your essays. My essays, I think, started as, okay, what if we start from a framework of criticism and then kind of blow that up to be more? So it was a lot of learning. Totally, no, and it's it's great. It's part of this challenge that you undertook and that made this book, I think, so so cool is because of how open you are. There's a lot of, I wanna say voyeurism in the book where you're observing your environment, your relationship with your body and the environment, skateboarding, even uh, you know relationships in, in really interesting ways. And um, some of your comments made me, they, they opened up a whole bunch of stuff, but like, you know, I'm coming from poetry and had to train myself to become an essayist over time as well. So I totally feel you on that challenge of you know, going from one form to the other, allowing yourself to be open to that change. I felt that throughout a lot of your essays, you you really experimented with your form as, in this case, an essayist. You know, there is moments of poetry and, you know, narrative structure that is similar to a novel in terms of breaking down a scene. Um, did you find yourself, as you got deeper into the book, more comfortable with experimenting with form in that way, like how it affected your prose and stuff? I mean, I think what I will say is that um, what, I, what I love about writing fiction is thinking about things like the difference between scene and summary. Like what is, what, what can a scene do that summary can't? Um, and so, you know, what intrigues me about telling stories is essentially the manipulation of time, right? Mm -hmm. um, passing a year in a sentence and then settling into a moment and occupying that moment for 10 pages or whatever. Um, and the fiction that I love is fiction that manipulates time. Um, 
that that doesn't make me good at storytelling though right i mean that the, to be to be in love with the manipulation of time is in some sense to be an irresponsible storyteller right a story should be moving forward it should be it should be moving toward a climax tension should be rising and so on um so i think what makes me a less than stellar storyteller um has made me uh perhaps a, a, a more promising essayist um, because an essay, again, like a poem, has no obligation to time. An essay can, can tell a story, can put you in a place, can move you through a city as time is passing, um, or it can just abandon time altogether and move into the realm of exposition, where you're just doing research, or you're talking about a subject, or you're leveling an ode to a particular season, or flower, or a person whom you love. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I think I think I grew more confident with essays, um, and I also think there was a reciprocity there, where the more that the book came to be, um, the more that it was clear what it needed um, to kind of to kind of resonate in the ways that I wanted it to. So you know, the sort of fifteen or so, I think, it, or maybe it's eighteen um, essays proper. Uh, exist and then there are these sort of interstitials um, that are on whatever so like the one I read is on narrative um, and yeah there was there was a real joy there for me in thinking about how those could fill in how those could slot in and do a certain kind of work I mean I really can't stress enough Jose that like writing this book was an exceptional joy to me yeah. um, and after after seven to nine years of pure opposite of joy in writing and feeling the labor of it and the struggle of it and the frustration and the misery and the the betrayal of it and the shame of all of it you know like to to sit down once this book was was signed as a book and i had to do the rest of this stuff it just became like the most pleasurable writing i've ever done and i had never really known that pleasure like I had never known writing as pleasure and I teach, you know, I, I sit in front of my kid, I stand in front of my kids and I, I walk back and forth and chew my glasses and pontificate about you must love your writing because it will not reward you. And then I'd go home and like weep with like, <laughs> what am I doing? Um, and so this was the opposite of that. Like, I can't, I cannot stress enough that the last, the later stages of writing this book were the most kind of sublime artistic experience I've ever had. Um, and I'm very grateful to that. And I'm grateful to Wes Miller, my editor, for giving me the room to do that. And, you know, really, this is going to like set off the alarms, the like cornball alarms. I'm very grateful to skateboarding because I, I think that yeah. skateboarding gave me that. Likewise. I mean, and shout out to good editors. I mean, everyone needs them. And, you know, like, but that's amazing to have the joy. You're writing about this thing that brought you so much joy and meaning and just soul to use one of the terms in one of the later essays in your book, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, to, to reference the Dylan essay, you know, skateboarding is so, you know, centrifugal to who you are in your existence to be able to apply this other thing that you're so passionate about and to have writing be fun is nice. so rare you know i talk I, i'm thinking about my friend lovely who writes uh on nuclear non-proliferation and stuff like that she goes under the moniker bomb shell toes it's her project and we always talk about how writing is the work you know it's the work it's the work <laughs> it's the discipline right you know it's it's shutting off it's pushing people away it's i'm gonna do this or you know i need to get done with x amount of pages writing before this meal gets consumed or whatever the case may be you know it's just but that itself can be a kind of trap right i mean like right. you know you it, when i tap into the sort of like writerly discourse that i see on twitter and that i hear when writers sit down and i see it more on twitter because i don't you know you talk to writers and you you can kind of um you you share whatever your frustrations are but you know there is also this sort of secondary marketplace for um misery like you know let's all talk about how hard writing is and um, you know, that itself is sort of dangerous because it, yeah. it doesn't need to be that way, right? Like, it, it could just be that, in fact, um, a, lot of, a lot of what we find miserable about writing is that our approach to it is unhealthy. You know, my, my approach being deciding when I was a young person that I was a novelist. Um, right. And, you know, because I was a novelist and because a novel was the only thing that I would take seriously for myself and count as a success, 
um, that foreclosed on a lot of possibility for me. Um, so I don't know. I, don't, I there there is a risk in kind of going too far the other way too. I think. Totally agree. Totally agree. Going back to your point about kind of stretching out time and having fun with the work, one essay I wanted to talk about was Inappropriate Places, which is about, it's centered around uh, two different things. It's the Democratic Natural Convention that happened in Chicago in, I believe, 68. Um, and the Picasso, you attempting to get a trick, a wall ride, shove it out on the Picasso mural in downtown Chicago. First question was the wall ride and the, you know, was the wall ride front side or back side? I think it was initially front side and then we went back side. Let me know. And, but you know, right, like an essay like that where you're talking about this historical moment, sometimes in the present tense, sometimes in the past, connecting it to you trying to escape this obstacle mm -hmm. and I won't give too much away. You know, um, how fun was that to write for you as a skater and as a new, as an essayist? Um, that, that one was super fun. You know, that one and the, the Dylan Reader essay were the two final ones that I wrote. I guess, the, well, no, technically the Jeff Grosso one was the final one that I wrote. But um, the, the Dylan Reader essay and the Picasso, as I think of it, essay were the two kind of like substantial ones that I knew had to be, um, for, for whatever reason, had to be in there. Um, so yeah, the Picasso one does... Um, you know, the Picasso one allowed me to try to like do some noveling work, right? To put the reader into the place of the unveiling of the Picasso. Um, and then later uh, a, a protest that took place, um, a skate protest that took place in the eighties. Mm. Um, and also dig a little bit into Pablo himself, you know? Um, I mean, the thing about the Picasso statue is um, several. First of all, it is, it is exceptionally fun, right? I mean, there's not a child who sees the Picasso, who doesn't want to run up it and then slide on their butts down it, or at least like wave their hands maniacally and run up the hill, right? I mean, it invites um, physical engagement. And mm -hmm. for the most part, that's allowed. That's okay. That is within the guidelines of the Daily Plaza, which is where it exists downtown. It's within their guidelines that kids are allowed to do that. What you are not allowed to do at all is have any wheeled object on it. Now, this is despite the fact that this is forge steel from Gary, Indiana, that is indestructible. There is nothing you could do. You, there's nothing any of us could do to damage this um, massive statue. Um, and, and, and yet still, you know, it's, it is, you know, the other thing the essay is about is the way that um, the American public kind of treats shared public space where we kind of police each other. Right. I mean, people don't want you skating on it. And those people aren't necessarily security guards. Right. People just have this sense that no, 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 don't you, we don't skateboard here that there's a park down the street. Um, so, you know, the good thing about writing about the Picasso is it allowed me to write about parks and kind of the, the ambivalence of the gift of parks and the way skate parks and their proliferation kind of give civilians or non skater people the the sort of argument of well look there's a place for that you got to go to it so yeah that was fun i mean it allowed that sort of it encouraged that sort of branching out um and it was yeah i mean that essay is wonderful it also like you know at that stage late in the book like i've already i've already been too serious you know like i've already scared away anyone by being like i'm this i'm going to take skateboarding extremely seriously for 300 pages and so by that point it's sort of like if you're on board if you're if you've made it to page 260 like we're we're together we're arm in arm walking into the you know the the apocalypse let's go um and so yeah it, you know at that point there's there's not a lot of caution like i can go ahead and say that like Dylan Reader um, is a kind of sacred individual, right? Without having to say he's a messiah, like he did something to skateboarding that I don't think anyone else has done. Um, yeah, and so it's like, well, look, I'm, I'm doing this and you're with me, so let's, let's go. That, that's great though. I mean, and you, I, I felt that throughout the book, you know, I, I, really, I really did. And um, I feel like in the beginning, you're really starting to introduce yourself what skateboarding is, what, what it is to you. And then I feel like the third section of this book, you know, was so, I really wanted to text you in May when I was reading it and be like, hey, so the third section of your book, I feel like it should be the new canonical standard for skateboarding writing. Hope you're having a good day. You know, like it was just like really solid pieces that 
skater skaters and citizen secular audiences alike can really get behind. Which leads me to the question of hanging out with Chaz Ortiz for a day. Would you do it again? And uh, when's the last time you bought or rode a Chaz Ortiz board? Because I haven't seen too many out in the streets recently, but I think he's still on DGK. But I just wanted to ask you about that. Um, I bought his, I bought his, or I'll answer those backward maybe. Um, I bought his, uh, his debut, his DGK debut I bought. It was like a Jason ho hockey mask with like roses twined around it oh, and like some right. gold and it was, it was, and it was a great deck. I it yeah. was a great deck. It was an eight, two, five. I was very pleased with it. Um, would I hang out with it? Yeah. I mean, I, Chaz is around like, this is, you know, the sort of, um, kind of pitch of that essay is that Chaz Ortiz like wunderkind is now just a normal person um, yeah. he's no longer he's no longer like he's not in the olympics he's not even in street league like what he is now is like a skater he's a particular kind of skater that i don't think we've ever had before which is a, a, a kid who made a great deal of money through a great deal of success as a young person got an extremely lucrative contract through zoo york um oh, yeah. and then you know was had you know good family support invested his money is the silent partner in some companies that pr people would probably be shocked to hear he's part of um and who also and i think very importantly really cares about skateboarding yeah. you know he's a skater um and so yeah would i hang out with him again absolutely and i do occasionally you know when i see him at the spot it's great to see him would I hang out with him in Machine Gun Kelly again? Like maybe not, right? I mean, now that I know who Machine Gun Kelly is, I you know, I don't know. It was a strange day, you know, like when you you set out to go and be a sort of journalist, which I'm not, right? For the most part, I'm not a journalist at all, but to do the sort of journalism thing, like I'm gonna write a profile and then to end up at a daytime dance club nightclub at 3 p.m. on a 60 degree day in February in Chicago like everything was weird and off so yeah I'd do it again I don't know that it would I would ever luck into a day like we had together fingers crossed you know the machine gun quality <laughs> was really my was really the question here so thank you thank you for asking that yeah yeah big star yeah <laughs> just want to remind folks that are tuning in in a couple of minutes we're going to be doing some Q&A around 6 45 pacific time uh so if you have questions for Kyle, uh, let us know in the chat in a little bit. Um, I wanted to go into, you mentioned kind of being like quasi reporter. I like empathize with that totally, like using journalistic tactics to tell, to, to write an essay, to, to, you know, use it as part of, you know, your argument or, or the, what you're presenting the folks. Um, I kind of wanted to ask about this. You touch on it in the Grasso piece, but it also exists in, um, uh, primitive progressivism and, and those pieces around pushing borders too. You know, you've written pieces that have stirred up, you know, I don't want to say controversies, but they've they've enlivened conversations within the skateboard industry. It's it's led to people getting called out for previous racist actions. Um, it's getting it's being you know folks aware of certain pro skaters and what they've done before. Um, you've encountered, I imagine, some pushback from folks in the industry. How did you? Kind of navigate all that stuff um you know when you know as an essay is getting this reaction to some of your work like how did you navigate that as you were finishing writing this book uh i think to answer that i have to um point out that one of that i have a career and i have a career yeah. that has nothing to do with skateboarding right i mean i'm a i'm a college professor and yeah. that's that's been my job from the get-go um and so I was never beholden to any of the sort of, um, you know, realities of the skateboard industry because I had never had any ambitions whatsoever to make it in the skateboard industry. Um, and I think that sort of freedom um, allowed me to come at it in ways that people who, whose jobs, you know, whose livelihood depends on either being a freelancer or having the connections or like, you know, sk skateboarding is a very small industry. Um, it feels really majestic and, um, you know, huge when you're on the outside of it. But, you know, the second you kind of get a glimpse into it, you realize like it's in the U S this is like a hundred to 150 people who are the whole industry. Um, and you know, if you, if you do something to cross 
one of those people, it, you can very quickly find yourself on the outside of all of the things you need to be inside of. Um, and so I think for me, being an outsider completely um, has, has been a necessary part of anything I've done. Um, the, the primitive progressivism was an article that was written in a state of anger. It was the only one that I wrote um, angry, but I wasn't angry necessarily about injustice. I mean, that was part of it um, or, you know, the, the sort of overt kind of racism and, um, you know, hatred that was, that was on display. Um, what I was really mad about, to be totally frank, was the fact that this is an industry that I've supported. I had supported up until that point for basically 30 years of my life, like paid into. Yeah. You know, I came, my rage was about like, yo, I've, I've, I've supported this. Like I, I've funded this. Like some of my money has ended up in Jason Jesse's pocket. Like the number of Corey O'Brien boards that I've bought along the way from Santa Cruz, the number of Santa, you know, like one of the first boards I ever bought was a Corey O'Brien, you know, the Reaper throwing the fireball. And so I've given Santa Cruz money. And so my anger was like, wait a second. Um, this is how we're going to handle this situation with silence, with this sort of pro forma apology and like wipe our hands and move forward. Um, so I, that was written from a place of anger at the industry that I was not part of. I was yeah. a consumer. Of. Um, and I, so, you know, uh, whether, whether that got me into any sort of trouble or like stopped me from being able to access certain people or, who I've angered along the way. Um, I, you know, I've been very fortunate to, to not really have to confront that very much. Yeah. You know, like I know factually that a thing I wrote um, about the 917 video pissed off a bunch of um, people who are friends of uh, Jesse Alba who made the video and Alex Olson and some of these, you know, I said a thing about Aiden Mackey. I said that he wasn't particularly athletic. And I know that a bunch of his friends took real exception to that, but they didn't take that out on me. I mean, they took that out on the magazine that published the article. Um, what I do know is when I was at Columbus Circle and all the 917 guys or 917 adjacent guys were skating there, I was very quiet and I was very alone by myself. And I didn't like go up there and say like, hey, you know, I'm the one who's, who wrote about you guys. So, you know, I mean, what I don't want this to be is that there, there was ever any courage involved on my end. You know, I was writing from a very privileged place as an outsider um, and anyone I've pissed off, I've never had to um, engage professionally or really even personally. So, you yeah. know, it, I've been fortunate. Uh, I appreciate the way, I appreciate you, you answering that, you know, and, uh, and uh, just your perspective on it. You know, I think it's just uh, as a writer and a skateboarder, it's just, it was just interesting to observe from the sidelines and as you know a fan of skateboarding yeah. work you know but i, I would know. if i could if i could add one thing jose was that like you know i mean I, skateboarding needs more people who are not beholden to the industry to be writing about it i mean that's the problem i mean this is the nature of the sort of um limitation on some of the conversations for a long time we've had and and i also want to say that i think the conversations have opened up a huge amount in the last mm -hmm. five years. I think that people are, you know, there's a lot more sort of self-governance within skateboarding now. There are skaters who are themselves more empowered to call out their peers. Um, that said, I do think we need more people who are not beholden to um, the, the industry itself to be able to speak about it, so. Yeah, I agree, you know, and like, it's, it's happening on all sides of the equation too, you know, it's mm -hmm. as, and as a writer who's now contributing to state publications, it's awesome that I feel comfortable talking about, you know, uh, racism or, you know, gender-based biases or sexism, harassment at skate parks, things of that nature. I'm glad these conversations are happening as in the wake of the Olympics and so many other things, skateboarding's on, you know, it's huge, you know, we're seeing it at, in terms of sales at skate shops, and we're seeing it in terms of them being on NBC and primetime programming for all the events. I mean, we're seeing it. So, yeah. you know, I that leads me to my last question before we hop into the Q&A. Um, you know, skateboarding, you wrote this book across, and I think you described this in the book, 
as like, you know, the decade where skateboarding changed the most and kind of changed in the direction that I think both you and I would have preferred to kind of see when we were kids in a sense, you know, some of these things kind of come to fruition. Um, where do you see skateboarding and the kind of culture moving in the next couple of years? Like where do you, all this energy from the Olympics, people's attention, more, more writers in the room of all different genders and races and, you know, non-American as well. How are you, you know, what are your hopes for the future in skateboarding? I mean, my hopes for the future is that it just <clears throat> continues to involve um, a, a, a sort of diversity of voices. Um, my hopes for the future is that the, the number of publications increase. My hopes for the future is that we get more kind of grassroots and DIY. We find models for um, publications and brands and companies that are supporting um, writers who or skaters who have traditionally not been supported. I think that's the most interesting thing. Like, I think that's gorgeous. Um, my concern for the future, which is a very real one, right? I mean, this, I, I don't think this is like Cassandra-ish or like the sky is falling-ish stuff. My concern for the future is that um, in the Olympics, we saw for the first time, asterisk, we saw for one of the first times we saw a non skate native organization telling us and telling the broader public what skateboarding means. Um, and I think that's very dangerous, right? Like, you know, the one time Nike really tried to tell us what skateboarding means was like the ghost, the skate every day campaign. And that just didn't really fly because a lot of skaters, you know, whatever Nike does, whatever big companies do, um, more or less what they've done is like profit from skateboarding. Hmm. But they've been very careful to not try to tell skaters what they're doing, right? Like, let skaters do whatever they're doing, for the most part, and we'll just find a way to kind of capitalize on their cultural cachet. Um, when Nike tried to tell us what skateboarding means, you skate every damn day, a lot of people are like, I don't want to skate every damn day. I want to skate every damn week, maybe. Um, and so to have the Olympics, um, which is the most powerful athletic narrative machine in the world, you know, every athlete has an origin, a middle, and the conclusion is, and now they're at the Olympics. Um, that's, that's, that, that's worrisome to me. That raises alarms for me because I don't think, um, I don't think, the, the general public uh, has enough sort of appreciation of what else skateboarding is to defend against the sort of narrative that the Olympics and that um, the athletic sort of industrial complex um, wants to tell about skateboarding. Um, mm -hmm. And so my hope is that we can counter those narratives with other things like weird non-narrative projects, like weird DIY day-long scavenger hunts like glue skateboard just did right like yeah. that we can find ways to continue to produce skateboarding that isn't interested in telling stories um and and you know serves as a kind of uh defense against what what we're seeing as a real attempt to tell the world what skateboarding is sportsmanship it's it's not sportsmanship it's skating it's 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 this other thing yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just as a reminder to folks, as we transfer into the Q&A, we're talking about the most fun thing, Kyle Beach's amazing new book. Uh, it's about skateboarding, it's about relationships, it's about life, it's about pursuing the life you want to lead and, uh, and observing the world and your relationship with it. It's a really beautiful book that I can't recommend enough. And Kyle, thank you for allowing me to badger you with questions. Uh, in a public digital space for the past hour. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna click into the Q&A a little bit here and uh, see what we have. Uh, okay, this is from a, a familiar voice. This is from Wes Miller. Uh, you might know him, your editor. Uh, thanks for the shout out. He says, what section of the most fun thing are you most excited for skaters to read? What section of the book are you most excited for non-skaters to read? And do you have any tips on switch flips? That might be too long of an answer for the switch flips, but you know, what are you most excited for the skaters and the non-skaters to read? Um, I'm most excited for the, the skaters. Thanks, Wes. Um, I'm most excited for the skaters um, to, to read part four. Um, 
I, I really stand by the Dylan Reader essay. I think it's um, I, like, I, I think it's the farthest that one can pursue um, the thoughts that skateboarding encouraged. It seems like to me, the sort of outer rim in a certain way. Um, so I'm excited for that. I'm excited um, that with Wes's help, we, we essentially built a book that leads you um, further and further afield. Um, so I, I, I hope that skateboarders will get deep enough into the book that they're willing to take that journey. Um, for non-skaters, uh, I, I don't know, man. I like, I, I think that, you know, for non-skaters, the sort of most obvious stuff that will resonate is stuff about marriage, um, stuff yeah. about aging, um, stuff about memory. Um, and I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of material in there about, um, you know, just life you know, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy for them to find that. And, you know, the reason I'm happy for them to find that is to maybe hopefully under, start making the connection that that is, that in fact is what skateboarding is about also. Um, as far as switch flip goes, Wes, like my, as you know, um, my kickflip comes from the 1980s or the very early 1990s, which means that I kick to the side. My switch flip is a much younger process and as such is not, um, loaded with all the sort of bad muscle memory of kicking outward. So my switch flip, um, it's pretty fresh. I can't really front on my switch flip. It's pretty good. Um, so my advice is, I don't know, just, I don't know, find some clips of my switch flip. <laughs> there you go, Wes. <laughs> you gotta, gotta find the footy, gotta find Kyle's footy. Uh, an amazing writer, uh, Nina Aron, uh is watching. Uh, what's up, Nina? Uh, I believe from Oakland, California. Uh, she says, I loved hearing what you say. I loved hearing you say that writing this book was a joyful experience, as do I. What would you tell a writer who is struggling to find that joy at the moment? Any advice? Asking for a friend, obviously. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Nina. Uh, I mean, you know, I can say that my, my sorrow came from a notion of what I was, I had decided I was supposed to be writing, right? And, um, a lot of that, I think, derives from the way that publishing works in the U.S. Um, you know, I I had an idea, and it was largely based on how the novel I was trying to write would be received. And by received, I mean maybe bought, maybe represented by an agent, and then maybe bought by an editor. Um, and I think for me that that was um, an ex it, that was a very powerful force um, and powerful in a way that I didn't even fully recognize. Um, and so, you know, I, mm, I didn't set out to write a book about skateboarding. Um, and the sort of miracle was that I ended up with a book about skateboarding. And so I think, I think the advice I would give is, um, again, this is one of those obvious things is like, you gotta, you've got to write the book that the material actually wants to be. Um, and, you know, be open to that, be open to the terrible, miserable, unthinkable outcome that what you're writing might not be it or might not sell and might be a novel that's only yours. I mean, the thing about my novel is I love it. You know, uh, Wes didn't want to buy it. Other editors don't want to buy it. Um, you know, it's a, I think it's kind of a small miracle that I got an agent to represent it, but I love it. I think it's great. Um, but you know, the fact is, is that it is what it is. It exists where it is. And, and this other thing came out of it. That's not a great answer. I thought it was great. I, and everyone should go by Nina's book, Good Morning Destroyer of Men's Souls. It is fantastic. Mm. Thanks again, Nina. Uh, we got a question from Mike Gartner. He asked more fun, colon, a few hours at Claremont Skate Park. This is Claremont San Gabriel Valley Inland Empire board in Claremont, not San Diego Claremont, respectfully. What is more fun, a few hours at Claremont Skate Park or many days and nights playing Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 on a PS3 in Clark 1? I believe this is a Claremont College question. This is. Uh, Mikey, hi. Hey, bud. Um, I think, and Jose, you can attest to this because you skated the Claremont Park um, in the Inland Empire. Uh, that was a great park. And the reason that was a great park is because it was a shitty park. Like what made right. that park great is the fact that it, it was strange and poorly designed and, you know, felt like a, 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 a street spot, you know? Um, uh, 
Mm -hmm. I skated like Richard Mulder skated there and I got to skate with Richard Mulder there. Um, you know, I, I think that wins, you know, when I think of the fun of playing Tony Hawk, what I think of the fun is, is like doing my best to mash the buttons in such a way that I get the highest score, which actually isn't fun. Right. I mean, what that is, is like achievement. Um, whereas pushing through Claremont skate park and like ducking the cops because you're supposed to wear a helmet, um, you know, like that, that was fun. I'll, I will never forget those weird nights at Claremont skate park and that weird satellite dish bowl. Um, Jose, what's your best memory from the Claremont skate park? Not being arrested. Not being arrested. Uh, <laughs> close. Um, there's a lot of history in that space. Um, even before the skate park was there, the building next to it, the youth activity center, the yak used to put on a bunch of punk and hardcore shows. A lot of buddy head record shows, Icarus Line, that type of thing, very early 2000s. But my favorite memory is probably knowing that JP Jadid is probably skating it as we speak. That's, <laughs> that's the best living memory. The people that grew up skating it are still skating it, myself included. If I'm in the 909, I'll, I'll be skating it. Was that, man, was, was that Manny Pad with the gap always there? Was that part of the building next to the park? Yeah, that was always there. Yeah, uh, with the rocks on the side. Yeah. Kenny Anderson had some tricks there and some other folks. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that was always there, thankfully. Mm -hmm. um, I, saw, I saw some clip recently. Sorry to make this a skate con con conversation now, but I saw some clip of someone skating. Was it an eight stair or a 10 stair rail? That sort of like classic right next to it. friendly yeah. rail there. Yeah. There something recently. Oh, is that David? It was that weird David Reyes part. I think he's skating. Oh, yeah. Like, you yeah. Know, in, a, in a tie dye and red wheels. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, great part, though. I mean, uh, we got another question. Eric Nenninger. Hi. Hey, Kyle. Love the book so far. What is your favorite or one of your favorite skate spots? And is it one of your favorites because it's a great spot to skate or because you have great memories skating it? Thanks, Eric. That's a great question, Eric. Yeah. Um, whoever you are, uh, Eric's an old friend. Um, my my favorite ever skate spot. I mean, you know, that's that's an impossible question. I think the the skate spots that stand out most to me in my memory are the ones that, um, you know, I mean, skating is like really actually technically a kids a, a kids activity, right? Like whatever it is. Um, however we understand it, it belongs to the youth. And the reason it belongs to the youth is because A, they're the most interesting. They create the culture in such a way that, um, you know, we can kind of stand back and marvel at. Um, but also because like, it's, it's in those formative years that you're sort of becoming a person. Um, and, you know, Eric is someone that I had the extreme joy of skating with a lot when he and I were both becoming people. Um, and there is, you know, St. Louis, Missouri is generally a kind of suburban area, but it has these little pockets of commercial regions. Um, and one of those pockets is called Clayton. And, you know, the downfall here is that Clayton competes with downtown St. Louis and, and you know, stops the city from really growing by taking its business. But the, the plus side of that is that there are these sort of semi-urban spots in the middle of the county. Um, and Eric and I grew up doing, you know, a lot of ride on what we thought of as ride on nose slides that were really slappy nose slides on out ledges on like three stairs. Um, and so I will never forget watching Eric do a, a slappy nose slide along this entire long gray granite out ledge from this stupid office building. Um, you know, I, I won't ever forget that. Um, and so, you, you know, is that my favorite? No, my favorite spot in the world is the one Alexis Sablone designed in Malmo, Sweden, where I had probably the best session of my life. But um, the, in terms of memory and in terms of meaning for me, that was when I was learning to be a person. And skateboarding played a really, really, really profound role in that becoming. So thank you, Eric, for that, for helping me be a person. Yeah, thank you, Eric. And uh, that's probably the perfect note to close this night on, you know. Yeah. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks to Green Apple for having myself and Kyle. Uh, please buy Kyle's book from an independent bookstore like Green Apple. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'll pass it over to you, Carl. Thank, thank you again, Kyle. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jose. This has been wonderful. Thank you.
This was such a treat, you two. Thank you so much. It was just like like a true joy. I really appreciate both of you joining us. Um, and I would be remiss in my duty if I didn't remind all of you to please buy um, The Most Fun Thing. You can also pre-order Interstate by Jose. Um, I think these books pair pretty well together. So if you need like one book to read and then another book to read after it, consider that. Um, also, if you already have a copy, I guarantee that you have a friend who would like one too. Oh, um, <laughs> so um, if you can, please do. Um, I'm also gonna go ahead and share our upcoming event calendar um, in the chat here. Um, but again, Major congratulations to you, Kyle, and thank you for sharing this um, with us and sharing your time with us and sharing your book with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, folks. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Be good.